shit what's up you know what time it is ladies and gentlemen it is shooting the shit uncensored and it is your boy the bald the beard the beautiful Piers austin that is right the australian sensation the motherfucker that's sweeping the nation baby and tonight today whatever time it is that you are listening to this i have a very special guest i have the one the only snuff daddy gore in the house but before i bring out the snuff daddy himself I just want to take a quick second, a quick pause for the cause to thank those sponsors that help us keep the lights on up in this bitch. First up is sleefs.com. That's S-L-E-E-F-S, sleefs.com. If you are an athlete or someone you know is an athlete, you have to check out sleefs.com. They have armbands, compression pants, compression tights, headbands, mouth guards, Boots, the whole nine yards, whatever athletic wear you need, baby. Sleeps have got you covered. And I'll tell you what, use promo code MWA pod to get a 10% discount on your final purchase, guys. Now, next up is healthfape.com. Now, guys, healthfape.com is your healthy vaping alternative, guys. If you are like me, you're an ex-cigarette smoker, you're now a vapor person if you're one of those douchebags that puts up big clouds in public places when you are not in lockdown then you need to go to healthvape.com all of their products are no nicotine no harmful or addictive chemicals and they are vitamin infused guys these are your healthy vaping alternative guys i've got mine on the way i'm waiting to get them in guys also use promo code mwa pod to get a 10 percent discount on your final purchase, baby. But guys, while we're at it, you can get an exclusive first look at this show, Shooting the Shit Uncensored with me. Look at that face. You got to check it out. And you can get an exclusive first look at Killing the Business with former ECW original, the Kingpin Angel motherfucking Medina. And you can also get an exclusive look at Get Funked, hosted by former WCW and TNA star Alan Kiwi Funk. And we also got one more for you. We got the Knights of the Gimmick Table, hosted by the Dead Presidents, Boogaloo and Lowrider. Guys, these are four amazing shows. Go to therealmnetwork.com. Subscribe to us, guys, and you will get these shows exclusively. You get an exclusive first look at all of these episodes. We drop four shows for you every single week, and we're shooting the shit. Sometimes we drop two to three extras so guys you definitely get your money's worth guys you can also head over and find us on all podcast platforms you can have a look at all of our uh, uh back catalog and also the shows after a certain period of time they get uploaded there and to our youtube channel so make sure you go subscribe like share all of that good stuff and help support us and you will definitely get some amazing content but tonight, guys, or today, wherever it is that you're listening, we are going to be interviewing the man, the myth, the legend, the snuff daddy, Captain Bukaki Gore. Here he is, Gore. Thank you for being on the shit. Ah, thanks for having me. What an intro. Thanks, Fuck, man. Hey, man. I, I, well, I had to give a, an intro of a, of a man of your <laughs> stature, you know, like. You're a one scary looking dude in that ring, man. So, uh, <laughs> I wanted to make sure I, I got you over the right way, bro. Yeah, nail on the fucking head, mate. Very good. <laughs> That's it, man. But how are you going, man? You, you're over in Melbourne, correct? You guys are in lockdown for, I think it's what, week <coughs> three, four? or uh, <laughs> Who the, the fuck even before? knows at this point, man? Three years by the feel of it. It's the same, same as last year. I think we were in lockdown fucking this time last year. Uh, I'm still working. I'm still training, weight training, of course, no wrestling training on. Uh, you know, just fucking carry on. <laughs> Man, you know, it, it's interesting. Like, I, I, uh, I, we discussed this earlier. I interviewed your brother, uh, you know, Cracker Jack, who is basically an Australian wrestling legend. For people who don't know, oh, yeah. go and check out Cracker Jack. He's been around for 20 something years and is a staple in the Australian wrestling scene. Uh, you yourself have, have broken in over the last couple of years, but from my understanding, you actually have a background in, in combat sports, uh, Muay Thai and shoot fighting. How did it, how did you sort of come into wrestling, man? Like, did we just getting sick of the shoot fighting? Like what was the, the thought pattern? Yeah, well, 
I always liked wrestling. Like I grew up around wrestling, did a little bit of training in it with um, Cracker Jack and my other brother, Logan, who wrestles for a bit. <clears throat> but then moved away from that, got into martial arts. Because I was more worried about um, fighting, self-defense was sort of my calling at the time. They moved more into pro wrestling. And it wasn't until, like, I don't know, 10 years or so later, that I just got tired of competing, of, um, you know, starving myself, being a hungry fighter. But I still wanted to be competitive and active. So it was an easy transition to pro wrestling from there. And it was always there because... You know, my other two brothers were always doing it. I had friends that were always doing it. So it was just a natural progression from there. So what sort of shoot fighting were you doing, man? Like, were you doing Muay Thai, MMA? I started off in um, traditional martial arts. Like, I uh, started with Taekwondo, and then <clears throat> I moved to Korea to get more into um, their other style, Hapkido, which is sort of like Aikido, but they still do kicks and all that kind of wussy shit. And it was from there that um, I had a friend that was in the Philippines who was saying he should come over and start learning uh, weapons training, like their Arnes, which is um, stick and dagger fighting. But while I was over there, <clears throat> while I was living in Korea and I went on a holiday to the um, Philippines, there was a guy there I met who was coaching mixed martial arts. So instead of actually going there for any kind of weapons training, I ended up getting sort of tangled up in mixed martial arts. And um, I ended up moving there after that. <clears throat> was there for a few years just fighting, training, whatever. Um, and after I finished, <clears throat> sorry, mixed martial arts in, uh, 2012, I had my last fight. Um, I got into freestyle wrestling and competed in that for two or three years in Melbourne, but the scene's really small in, um, amateur wrestling in Australia in general. Like you'll in America, for example, they'll have seasons and they'll get to compete every single weekend, but here you'll be lucky to compete fucking three or four times a year. So it was really limited amount of training partners. So I kind of got tired of that. But as I said, I still wanted to be active. Yeah. And man, you're a big dude. Were you were you a heavyweight when you were doing all this? Uh, my first pro fight was actually at heavyweight. I fought at, um, I was 200 pounds. It was fucking stupid. I, I had to get on this because I was in the Philippines. And I was yeah. just sweating and losing so much weight. I couldn't fucking hold on to anything. So uh, <clears throat> I had to jump on the scale fully clothed in jeans, heavy t-shirt, everything. My opponent, this, this massive Ukrainian proper heavyweight, gets on the scales. They're just these little panties. He was like 230 pounds. So my first fight it was that heavyweight. Big mistake. And then after that, I started cutting weight to um, 84 kilos, which there is – that was their light heavyweight for the promotion I was at. But universally, um, 84 kilos is middleweight. Yeah, wow. And I've I'll, packed I'll... on a lot of muscle since then. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, you know, once you, you, you sort of started to get, you know, decided to make the move into pro wrestling, you know, you know, was it straight away you were talking to your brothers going, hey, how do I start getting booked? How do I start getting, you know, proper <laughs> training? Uh, you know, what was the progression into that for you? Um, well, I've always had friends in the scene, like um, my friend Kellyanne. Well, she helped me get into it. But um, I always knew George, the hitman Julio. So I've met him mm -hmm. a few times just through wrestling, that kind of thing. He was always a really welcoming guy. So I started training down there with um, Kellyanne or Mad Dog McRae. I did a lot of sessions with him in my early days. And they sort of helped me through a lot of it. But it wasn't until like eight months or so that I started getting booking. And I, I didn't even hook up with Crackers until maybe, I don't know, six months into wrestling career. Because he just saw that I was getting used like shit. I wasn't wrestling anyone that was actually going to improve me. It was just everyone was <laughs> making me worse. And I was getting worse. So it wasn't until then that he actually intervened and um, improved everything there, went out. And it's probably a good thing that you had someone like him there as well, because, you know, I, I think he mentioned when, when we spoke that he, he saw certain things that people were sort of trying to get you to do certain spots. He's like, no, you shouldn't be doing things like that and sort of just more steering yeah. you in the right way of a big man style. Yeah, like, you guys coming from martial arts and that kind of thing, especially when you go to different gyms to train, you're always really respectful of the guys you're sparring with. And you always, you know, heed their advice. But I didn't want to come into wrestling and be seen as um, arrogant or an asshole and try to throw my weight around because it's really easy to do, yeah. especially with um, the promotion like I was at. They're all, you know, soft baby kids. I could easily snap in half if I wasn't too careful. They weren't trained or anything. They were barely trained in professional wrestling at the time. Yeah. So at the time, it was like, oh, you know, we want you to sell for these guys or, you know, this guy's going to kick the shit out of you. And, you know, it's some soft, pudgy kid. 
film twice the size of it doesn't make any sense. But I, I didn't want to go against anything. I was just really accepting. Like, yeah, sure, whatever you say, whatever you say. And, of course, Craig is like, no, that's bullshit. What are you doing? You don't sell for any of these fucking kids. None of them deserve to have to put you down. But so he's, he's, he's right. He, he's right. Yeah, absolutely. Lot of sense, man. absolutely. Like, yeah. You know, like when I go and I see a show and I see someone who is five foot five, you know, wiping out someone who's six foot six, I'm like, <laughs> bro, I'm five foot six. <laughs> And I'm a solid five foot <laughs> six. I ain't taking someone down who's six six and a hundred and plus kilo. That ain't happening. Yeah. You know? Like, <laughs> yeah. But I think that that's probably the right thing as well, and also the the good thing long term for your career uh, to be able to to have that sort of mentor there, and especially being your brother who can step in and sort of, you know, being a veteran as well to sort of step in and say, "Hey, I'll take the heat. You're not doing that. Back the yeah, fuck up." Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Pulls that old veteran card. It always <laughs> works wonders. But it made a big difference. Even just having someone like a um, match uh, structure and psychology, all this kind of thing. Because for the most part, most shows don't actually have agents or anyone to help you through. So mm. if you're new to the game, you're just listening to your opponent who should be someone who's been in the business longer than you. And whatever they say goes. And whatever they're saying is gospel. But if you're, you know, you start having the business at um, one of the lower promotions and you've just paired up with some random dickhead who's barely trained, but just been around for a long time. You're just sort of taking everything that they're saying. Which, I don't know, with the younger guys, like um, some of the newer guys in Melbourne anyway, you just see they don't really train as much. And then when they do train, <clears throat> if it's unguided, they'll just go in there and practice random moves. They're not thinking about why they're doing the moves are actually working. It's just like kids training, you know? Like when you were 15 and you're back out practicing F5s on a fucking mattress. But that's the thing. It's yeah, more focused. It, it sounds like they're focusing more on the moves than, I suppose, to the actual psychology. What pro wrestling is like? It's not just a bunch of moves all put together in sync. Yeah, that's right. And it really shows. Did, how did you find going from being like in you know doing combat sports to then doing where you basically have to give yourself to your opponent almost in matches? Was that something that took you a while to sort of you know? I don't want to say wrap your head around, but sort of start to, because it's almost like when you have a combat sports background, your whole thing is to defend yourself and not let someone take you down, especially coming from an amateur wrestling background. Did that take you a while to sort of come to grasp with? Yeah. I mean, it can be a struggle now, even like um, I train with um, Jay Andrews at the MCW Academy. He's really big on, showing vulnerability which is a real challenge for me especially because if you're in there with someone it's different if i'm in the ring with fucking um like jake andrew arthur or kate van Ugg or a guy like tommy knight where it's a really 50 50 back and forth thing or they can just wipe me out at any point when you're in there with a smaller guy and you got to give yourself to them it can be hard not to just you know want to force them down and just impose your will and take control of the situation that's that's a real uh, challenge but it's a constant yeah. progress yeah, like, but as, as far as like, you know, going and, and starting getting out on shows, you know, did you start to see the progress straight away that as soon as you sort of started team, like getting partnered up with your brother and him sort of stepping in, did you start seeing that progress instantly? Or yeah, sort of, yeah, you know? yeah, big time. Everything was much clearer and I wasn't just um, putting guys over that shouldn't have been put over. You know, like yeah. early on I was wrestling either um yeah, mostly kids, like 19-year-old skinny kid who's never trained in his life. He just, yeah. you know, like I said, goes into the gym and practices his favorite moves. And Cracker yeah. Jack was quick to, um, like, kibosh all that shit. So, no, 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 that doesn't make sense. Why would you sell to this kid? You're going to make him earn it. And even then, don't give it up. <laughs> yeah, oh, look, a absolutely. But, you know, as far as, you know, watching, you know, the business as well, like, when you, do you sort of, like, look at a more of a big man style like who do you sort of try and you know look at for inspiration for your style of wrestling uh, i like all the guys who can actually go like um dr death steve williams the steiners gary albright i really like watching that kind of thing um not so much the big hoss fights i think they're kind of boring they're good every now and then but then just trading forearms is boring i want to see you guys actually wrestle you know, work limbs, go for holds. Um, not so much the, I don't know, the pro wrestling style where there's a lot of running spots. It just doesn't really do that much for me. Um, especially modern day wrestling, it just bores me for the most part. Because no one's, very few people actually like wrestling. 
anymore as they used to. Like, if you watch the old WCW, or, you know, Dean Malenko, the cruiserweights go at it. It was much more storytelling through, um, you know, the catch wrestling background mm. that it actually came from. And that's the kind of stuff that I prefer to watch or mimic. But it's not often, or at least um, not many times, I've been able to uh, work with someone that actually wants to wrestle or can wrestle. Like, Tommy mm. Knight was really fun to work Um Dick Andrew Arthur, Richie Taylor's good to work because he always wants to wrestle, doesn't just want to go into forearm trade-off spots or, you know, let's just hit some running spots because you lose me interest uh, instantly. For one, I forget it all because it's not anything that I do naturally or appeals to me and it just doesn't interest me. So there's a real difference in feeling um, when you're in the moment in there and it's real and it's competitive mm-hmm. and you can feel it and the crowd can see it compared to just um, going from bit to bit. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, hundred percent. And one of the things I, I really like, like I've seen a few of your matches. I saw the Tommy Knight match, and I think it was the goal, uh, not the uh, the uh, the match with UGG. Sorry, and I really I like you know your striking because it looks so lethal. It looks like you were taking guys' heads off when you are doing those kicks. You know, as far as like you know, learning to control that sort of stuff, was that easy sort of thing for you to be able to do? Yeah, actually, um, my first um, martial art taekwondo it was all non-contact, which didn't, which was sort of detrimental later on when I was in um, actual combat sports. But it was all about control and just pulling your punches and kicks short. Hmm. So control was actually the first thing I learned. It was harder to unlearn that when I got into um, like Thai boxing and that kind of thing, and I had to hit full force. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, and, with a guy like Ugg, you can hit him as hard as you fucking can, and he'll he'll be fine. You know, he's yeah. just a giant wall of meat. But <laughs> if you work with someone small, then it's it's much harder. Like um, one of the smaller guys, you can't just lay into them full force because you'll injure them. You don't want to injure them; you just want to hurt. Them, you know? yeah. Oh, hundred percent. What was the <laughs> what was the idea? Because I, I, like behind the mask, though, like did you always want to have your face covered when you were wrestling? Um, not really. I mean, I was always worried about getting booked as uh, Johnny Kick Pads, but I always liked um, uh, like big in horror films, that kind of shit. And I'm a big fan of Guar, and of course, mm-hmm. Odorous Urungus, and they've got these fucking insane Guar lore behind them, and the look is just everything. So that always appealed to me, and it looks different. It's a point of difference as well because not many other people are doing that. There's a few mask goons out there, but um. For the most part, they're usually just fat guys with a mask on. It doesn't actually change anything about them. And it made me oh. stand out more for my brothers because I look like my brothers a lot, especially my other brother, Logan. Yeah. So it was just basically for you to sort of make your own name in the business and not sort of be like, yeah. oh, it's the younger brother of Logan and, and Crackers. Yeah. Well, it's sort of an eyesore as well. I, I, like, um, I really like extreme metal, so I like it to be sort of bold and obnoxious too, which I think it is. And the name Gore, how did that sort of come about? Uh, I really liked um, Legion of Doom, uh, Demolition, that kind of thing. And they've all got the, like Smash, Crush, Axe. So I think Gore was the natural progression from that. Yeah, nice. Kind of like a throwback uh, for the, you know, thing for the name. I, I dig it, man. I, like, I, I really enjoy watching you, know, you work, to be honest, because I, I like the style that you have. It's very, it brings a level of realism to it as well, especially when like someone, I, like I've got a background in, in combat sports as well. So when I see someone doing certain kicks and punt, like style of kicks, I'm like, okay. I, when I sort of found out that you're doing, I'm like, it makes a lot of sense the way that your sort of stances are as well. Um, but also the execution of the strikes to me, it was like, wow, this is like, this is something I really get into when I, I can see that level of realism in the strikes. But yeah, I mean, that's what I like in wrestling is uh, when there's intensity there, you know? Yeah. Oh, it's like, holy shit. It, it's got that real shock factor, that real shock and awe factor to it. Not just checking the strikes, but you see something laid in. It's like, oh, my God, that makes me feel uncomfortable, you know, because of how graphic and violent it is, so that meat pounding meat sound. Yeah, and that's the that's exactly the right thing. I think as well when people sort of know what the pain feels like to be kicked or to be hit, when they <laughs> see someone who's got like a good – you know, form in doing it and can make it look as real as possible. That's the thing that sort of people can sort of, they understand that pain because everyone, well, most people in the world have been kicked or punched in their life. You know? 
Yeah, that's the reaction we want. If they haven't, they should be. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone should be hit in the face at least once with a closed <laughs> fist. But, um, you know, as far as like, you know, when you did sort of start getting into the business originally, was did you, your brothers try and talk you out of it in any way? Were they like going, no, nah, you should probably stay away from wrestling? Or were they pretty much going like, no, you should be in it? Like, I mean, they didn't have to say anything because both, <laughs> both of us sort of a cautionary tale. As it is. Like, um, my brother Logan, he fucked his back wrestling. He lived a fairly sedentary lifestyle. He's not dead. Um, he, he lives a fairly sedentary lifestyle. Then he'd just go to the gym, do some bench press and get in the ring and take all these crazy bumps. He's a big guy. He's like 6'2". Yeah. He's probably 120 kilos when he was wrestling. So naturally, his back went boom. Um, he's done. Uh, Cracker Jack is a little more resilient, even though <laughs> like the gods of fate are telling him otherwise with a solid DVD player to the head, all this kind of thing. Like I remember looking at him when I was younger and thinking, Jesus Christ, I don't want to be like him but um here i am regardless but i'm not going to take a solid dvd player to the head so i've seen the damage that it can do firsthand <laughs> oh like is the deathmatch style something that you you want to try and put your your toe into um yeah i mean i'd try it once or twice i don't know but it'd have to be for a good reason i wouldn't do it just for the sake of doing it but i'm not really big on death matches there are some guys who are like who um like wrestle and fight and do death matches, which is cool. But yeah. just people going through the motion, same thing. Like the I'm gonna hit you with this, bang! All right, what's the next thing? Just go from spot to spot. Um, it's just sort of senseless to me. There's meaning behind it. There's a reason to gouge someone's head open. Then it's a little more exciting. Like I always love um Mad Dog's matches. He's had some really cool death matches. A few others, but for the most part, it's just a um, spectacle. I think you know, good good wrestling's good wrestling. It doesn't matter what genre it is, and I think deathmatch wrestling yeah. probably over the years gets a lot of negativity b because of all the extra gimmicks and bullshit that goes into it. Like I'm a fan of deathmatch wrestling if it's done right. Like I don't want to see guys like standing around, walking around, gigging themselves. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. Like have that bit of illusion to it, <laughs> if that makes sense. Like give it yeah. a meaning and a reason why you want to like gouge someone's head open with a broken light tube. <laughs> like, yeah, like that's there a pretty seems hard to be a lot of people that gravitate towards it because they don't want to train or they mm. don't want to actually learn how to wrestle. They don't want to work as death matching. If you're just doing light tubes and that kind of thing, although superficial painfully as it is, they just, um, you don't need to train. Like how do you train for a death match wrestler? They don't go to the gym. <laughs> if I can go to wrestling and practice their moves, and like, um, I remember talking to this um, about this with Cracker Jack. He's like, who gives a shit if some fat guy in tracksuit pants gets his face destroyed? It's a fat guy anyway. I want to see a beautiful person getting her that get clawed up. And that's way more dramatic. Like, if you don't give a shit about your body enough to fucking go to the gym and work out, then who cares if you're going to get it clawed up or gouged with a fucking hacksaw or anything? Well, that's the thing, man. Like the wrestling wrestling business is a cosmetic business as well. And I think that, you know, like if you're going to be a professional wrestler, you need to be able to put in the effort. You need to be like for me, being able to look the part when I've seen some clips from some like really like bum fuck middle of nowhere shows where guys are like 300 kilos and like <clears throat> sucking in air in between spots. It's like. Dude, you just look like my uncle Daryl had just walked out of the pub and had a fight <laughs> with some. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. you know, wrestlers need to have that sort of. You know, I think everyone can have different body shapes and stuff like that. And but I think yeah. that professional wrestlers they do need to sort of invest in looking like a professional when they're presenting themselves to an audience. Mm -hmm. And that's not to say that every wrestler has to be a jacked up badass. Like you can be a no. big fat sloppy fuck, but you got to be able to look the part when you're in there. Not just yeah. heaving and hoeing after one shitty strike than you're out. You're still going to be able to go. I mean, a guy like um, Trevor Murdoch, I mean, he, if you saw him outside of wrestling, he'd look like shit. But fuck, you see that guy wrestle and it's, it's real. You can understand instantly that the guy can go. Dusty Rhodes, same uh, you thing. Still lose that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, they, they have that level of badass about them. They can still go. They still have that energy um, and that that sort of that drive because to be able to get over, but it, it's, it's, you know, very rare that you see someone like that, that really has that sort of, 
you know, can tick those boxes without being a certain look or a certain way. Yeah, very true. But, um, you know, as far as the, the character itself, like, did you have, like, you know, you mentioned being, you know, fans of, like, Guar and, and, and bands along those lines. Were you wanting to be this sort of aggressive, horror-filled, you know, guy? Like, what was the thought pattern that went into creating the Gore character for you? Uh, it was sort of just building it up as I went. Like, at the start, I just wanted to be a sort of... Um, because I didn't start off with the mask. I started off as Gore, but I was just wrestling in um, biker shorts and boots and just wrestling, with, you know, Shooter McGavin and his professional wrestling. But then when I got the mask, it started to come together a lot. And um, Cracker Jack uh, helped a lot with that. Like, um, saying to take inspiration from guys like uh, Jason Voorhees or Leatherface and the way they posture, the way they move, all that kind of thing. But, um, it's sort of built up as it comes. And then, of course, how I move naturally in the ring sort of adds to that. Like, I'm pretty obnoxious in day-to-day life. Um, so if I hit someone, I'm going to laugh about it because you know, other people's pain is pretty funny. I mean, it's a good joke. So I should express that when I'm in the ring. But that only came with like, building confidence while I'm wrestling as well. It's one thing to be able to get in there and do your moves and um, go through a match, but then another thing to like be present in the ring and be on the whole time. Yeah, so they just it's, came with practice and sort of adds to it. Yeah, I mean, as as far as promoters go, like in Australia, like I think you know, with the Australian scene, it's very because Australia is such a small place. So you know, have you ever had promoters that have tried to get you to deviate from your character in any way? Um, yeah, there's been a few promoters that um because they saw the mask and like, oh, this guy's Kane, so we don't want you to talk. But we just want you to stand there and be big and do choke slams. Like I never fucking do choke slams. I'm not tall enough to do choke slams. Most of the guys I wrestle the same height as me, so it doesn't even make sense. And not talking is just stupid. I always yell and carry on like an asshole. That's that's me. That's what I do. So to silence me, I have promoters say, No, I don't yell anymore, we're just doing you. This is what you to growl, all right? That's more scary. Like what the fuck? I'm not Kane. I'm not gonna stand here and just growl like a biff. So I've always gone out there and just done my thing anyway and if there's blowback from it, it hasn't been much or they haven't said it to me anyway so it doesn't matter anyway yeah i mean i think as well like just going out there and being silent and just growling and stuff like that sort of style of big man monster whatever you want to call it in wrestling it's kind of like a little bit past its its time you know what i mean because like you don't see many characters just standing there like grunting and grizzling and stuff like that because at the end of the day, I think that the audience is a lot more smarter to the business now. So they just go, we know this is just some dude. Like, it's not like, we yeah. know this guy isn't like being, you know, locked away for the last 25 years in a, you know, a cell somewhere. Like, it's... <laughs> yeah, but it adds more believability. Um... Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, for those promotions that have asked me to do that kind of thing, um, I don't know if there's that correlation or not, but they're more or less not in business anymore. So who's to say <laughs> what it really is, their decision-making or what? <laughs> I, I can't believe any wrestling promoter made any bad decisions ever. <laughs> <laughs> Please. <laughs> But, you know, as far as like, you know, then, you know, getting your name out there and starting to get booked on some of the, the bigger known promotions here in Australia, you know, how long did it take you before you started getting recognized by some of the bigger promotions and getting out there? It took a while. Um, like I was wrestling my promotion in Melbourne most consistently. Um, but no one watches it. Like there's 30 people a show. If you're lucky, maybe 40. But I was there, I, don't, I can't tell you how long exactly, but it must have been at least a year where I was just there. Um, but no one ever saw it, so no one, no other workers didn't even know who I was. But um, it wasn't until I hooked up with Cracker Jack and he started pushing for me in other promotions that I started getting booked and more recognition. But um, in Deathmatch Down Unders helped a lot because they've got such big exposure. and um, They look after us there pretty well. <coughs> so that's helped a lot. And um, MCW, which is the last show that I worked at, that's taken a while to get on, which is understandable. I wasn't ready for it for a long time. I've still got a lot of um, kinks to iron out in my game, which is always going to be the case. But that's 
I didn't really want to go anywhere I wasn't um, deserving of. There's nothing worse than, you know, giving a shit performance to a bigger crowd or in front of an opponent that you're just going to make look shit with by being not ready. Yeah. You know, so it's taken up until now. I think it's been four. I don't know if you want to count this year or last year, but it's taken a while. But I'm still yeah. told by others that it's been faster than their road. It, it You know, it, it probably has in a certain degree, but, you know, I think that if you don't have the skill, like the opportunity doesn't come. Like I think relationship will get you so far, but it, it comes down to the quality of performer of to actually go out there and, and get over and also to put on good matches in order to get consistently booked by promotions that have got a higher recognition than the smaller. Yeah, well, that's like getting to work with better guys as well because you learn so much just through wrestling alone. Like with fighting, it was um, if you have one fight, that's the equivalent to like six months training, you know. And yeah. I think something there's something similar with um, wrestling as well, where you have one match, whether it's good or bad, you just learn so much through the experience. So the more you wrestle, and obviously the better guys you wrestle, the better you're going to get, and then more exposure and everything else leads from there. Have you had much uh, experience getting out? to other promotions in other states like New South Wales, Queensland, um, and say, no, I haven't worked in any other states um, other than Melbourne. It's only been since um, last year that I've really been wrestling more consistently and at more places. Hmm. But I'm still pretty fresh to that, to being you, more than one place. Do you want to try and go interstate eventually? And how far away do you yeah. think that is post lockdown, let's say? <laughs> Uh, well, I'll wrestle anywhere. You know, I just want to wrestle. It doesn't matter if it's in front of a thousand people or five guys in a backyard. I just, I just like to wrestle good matches. Yeah. Um, I don't know how far off that is. I mean, anything, all hopes and dreams feel shattered at this moment. But like we was talking about before we yeah, started, it's yeah. just one day at a time at the moment. Everything else is irrelevant, really. Hmm. What were what was your main goal like when you started in wrestling? Did you did you have any goals that you were sort of like locked into, you know, where you wanted to take wrestling or how far you wanted to so, take No, not really. I mean, I just want to be a good wrestler. That's it. I just want to wrestle with matches. I don't care about getting signed or anything. Like I hate all the promotions that people want to get signed to anyway. I don't want any of the current product. So none of that really matters. I'm just keen on having good matches and um being a good worker, someone that's sought after, you know, that's the same with fighting. I never cared about, um, a lot of my friends at the time, everyone was pushing to get into the UFC, but I didn't care about getting signed to the UFC. I just wanted to have good battles. You know? Oh, a hundred percent. Not necessarily winning or losing, just good fights. So, you know, you mentioned, you know, that you don't watch the current product. Do you predominantly when you are sort of studying tape or, or watching wrestling, do you try and stick to more of the old school sort of style? Uh, I'm usually go by the wrestler. Like I look up some Steiner brothers, or I really like Gary Albright, or Vader's always a good go-to. Um, some Japanese stuff like um, Kenta Kobashi. I was checking mm. out; he's pretty cool. Or if someone recommends something to me, but if I watch uh, like most of the recent stuff, I watch it would be Botchamania. That's all I see of <laughs> WWE or AEW. That's my exposure to it. I was watching um. Uh, NWA Power when they had that weekly YouTube show and I really enjoyed that but I haven't seen mm. much of that since they stopped that and started doing more pay per view. Yeah, man, I think NWA, you know, definitely had a, a different sort of feel to it to what other promotions yeah. were doing. And I think that that was Absolutely. probably the, the, yeah, it was almost like it reminded me about being a little kid and watching, you know, wrestling when I was like five or six years old, and it's like that mm. sort of studio feel. Um, the, yeah. the current product with, with major promotions, I struggle to watch. I watch it because I kind of have to, but I sit there and just be like, <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. it's hard to enjoy. Yeah, it's hard to watch. Even the way they film it, like I hate these extreme zoom-ups they do. They cut away from some of the strikes. It's just so frustrating to watch. Everything's bright and shiny. Yeah, I mean, it, but even from a storyline aspect as well, you watch it and it's just like, like what? <laughs> like I, I'm not in the business, but I sit there and I watch something. And I'm like, what the fuck? Like that makes zero sense to me. That there's like, yeah, right. Yeah, you know, clearly I, I can't be the only one that watches this and just goes, <laughs> what? Well, no one yeah. seems to hate wrestling more than wrestling fans, anyway. Well, 
you're, you're exactly 100% right, but we still watch it, you know? So yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's always, and I think that that's the thing, like there's always going to be that audience and it's like, they just want to like, it's all some fans just want to get pissed off <laughs> after they watch it. And it's like, what the fuck, yeah. bro? But, right. <laughs> you know, it, it's another level of it. But as, as far as storyline goes, like, with you do you 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 know have you had opportunities to be in any sort of long-term storylines um and if so like is that something that you enjoy doing being able to tell a long story uh there's a few times we've tried it um the first promotion i was at was sort of a bush league one a lot of guys there weren't very good but um it was always fun because crackers and i were just (laughs) left to do whatever the fuck we wanted so (laughs) we just fucked around uh, pissed off pretty much everyone. I think Alex went out um, of his way to offend absolutely everyone in the crowd and backstage, and there was no, there was um, no consequences for it because we didn't care anyway. But um, in terms of long term storytelling, there's been one or two promotions. One of them we tried it, but um, lockdown happened, and I don't think they're ever coming back. And that goes for another promotion that we tried it at, and then same thing, lockdown happened. I don't know if it'll ever come back. Uh, they're not always good, but I guess it's up to you to make the most of it. I mean, both storylines were pretty stupid that I've been involved in. For the most part, it's just um, match after match. Like, death match down under. If we have something going, it's usually created by crackers. Like, he'll push for it. Dude, that's, yeah. He's really good with that. Well, apart from that, we haven't actually had any long-standing stories. Just short-lived feuds for the most part. Is that something you think that you'd like to sink your teeth into more? Um, yeah, it's with the right person. That'd be good. I'm happy just being a competitor. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah, it's like, going to be for the right reason. Like having that sort of like that aggressive go out there, like a prize fighter type of style. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's definitely what I prefer. But what, just what's up? Uh, the hell. Just... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, you know, have you ever, like, you know, been going in there and had someone try and, like, test your, like, credentials as being someone who is a shooter? Like, has anyone gone in there and gone, oh, I want to see what this guy really is made of? <laughs> um, Jake Andrew Arthur, every time I see him, it's <laughs> that <laughs> training or backstage every fucking time. But um, in terms of in the ring, uh, I went to Japan early on and wrestled at... um. Master Fugo's promotion, Underground. And uh, I wrestled this guy named Buki. I don't know anyone, any of these guys. Uh, Mad Dog introduced me to them. But um, before the match, he was like, oh, you just hit me. No problem. No problem. Hit me hard. No problem. So, oh, okay. Then the ring, and um, I was just thinking, you know, club him to the side of the head. But he hit me so fucking hard. He sent me flying back into the ropes. He must have done that three times. Mm. Yeah, all right. He wants me to hit him hard. So I drew back a forearm and hit him. And he just went straight down. And the ref starts counting it. No one really told me what was going on before or after the match. But it wasn't yeah. until like a couple of months later that um, someone told me that it actually knocked him out. And everyone from the back is coming out and cheering him on. All the other workers are cheering him on. Like, I had no idea. I thought it was all part of the show. But I think they thought that he was actually in trouble, that I'd gone out of my way to hurt him. But I was just giving it back to him. So we beat the shit out of each other for about 10, 15 minutes, but it was all fine after that. But before that, maybe he was taking liberties or maybe he was just trying to stiff me hard. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it's definitely one of those things where I think in, in this day and age, I don't know if you probably see guys that want to go out and try and take liberties, um, but probably back yeah. in, years ago, it, it was probably definitely the case. Yeah, so I've heard. I mean, not maybe not so much in Melbourne. Um, mm. I know Crackers... And Logan have beaten it. <laughs> Famously gone out there and beaten the shit out of guys they didn't like. And there was nothing they could do. Nothing the other guy could do. But uh, from everything I've heard, they had it coming. But uh, I think those days are long behind for the most part. There, I mean, very few athletes into professional wrestling. They're mostly nerds. And then they become athletes through wrestling. Yeah. So I don't think there's really as much ego as that. Like, if people want to beat someone, they'll just um, have a better match than rather than go out there and double leg them and snap on a figure four or anything like that. Oh, absolutely. But, you know, as far as like your, your actual training itself, like how has that evolved over the years? Like going from, you know, whether it be weight training, martial arts training, pro wrestling, has that, you know, your conditioning training changed much over the years from being, you know, a combat sports to a professional wrestler? 
Uh, when, when I was doing combat sports, it was much more conditioning focused. Um, I didn't really get much into the strength training until I was finished from fighting. I actually worked, started working with um, a really good trainer, Phil Kabatsky. He's one of the Russians who introduced kettlebell training to Australia back in the early 2000s. So I started training with him, just learned so much more and started getting more addicted to um, strength training more than anything else. So, and I always liked, um, you know, watching wrestling growing up, everyone's fucking jacked to the gill. So I've always preferred that rather than the skinny conditioning CrossFit boys. <laughs> and these days I focus much more. I go through cycles. So um, I might do six to eight weeks or 12 weeks of strength training. And then uh, for deloading, I'll do a phase of hypertrophy or um, just high volume. And then um, if for body composition, I don't like the way I look, I'll start restricting my calories and do much more conditioning. But for the most part, I, I prefer heavy lifting. Training. It's yeah. much more fun. Um, <clears> in <throat> terms of martial arts training, when we were out of lockdown, I was just getting back into jiu-jitsu. I was never really a big fan of jiu-jitsu. Even when I was fighting, I just liked to hit things, and I really liked amateur wrestling back then. But um, I'm trying to get back into that because it's been a long time since I've done enough for that, especially with the gi. So I was always just doing no gi, and grappling is so much more than um actually learning jiu-jitsu when I was rolling. So I'm getting more into that. I'm not doing as much striking. I mean, I work full-time in a boxing gym, so I'm always coaching other boxing or kickboxing. And um, apart from that, I really like my weapons training. Still, I practice that pretty regularly. It's um, Arnis, which is stick and dagger fighting. Yeah, you mentioned the, the stick and dagger fighting as well. And, you know, have you ever been in a situation where you've, like, had someone try and, like, go at you with a knife on the street? Like, has that ever had to come into play for you? Um, not a knife, but I've never been attacked with a weapon, thankfully. But, I mean, um, when I was competing, I was working security. I worked security around Melbourne in bars, clubs, um, kind of thing, for about 10 years. I had some situations then, but they were always over pretty quickly. I never had to use a weapon. Yeah, ne never never was needed for. Like, it's... Yeah, that's I, right. You make yourself think, a weapon, mate. <laughs> But I think as well, like with that sort of stuff, like correct me if I'm wrong, with that sort of weapon training, is it also a lot of, a lot of like d learning to disarm people that are trying to attack you with something? Yeah. I mean, if you can, you learn first with the weapon and then that translates to empty hands. Unless, um, well, that's in this system. Anyway, we do a lot of disarms, but um, for the most part, you don't need to learn how to use a knife to kill someone with a knife. You can just do it in a flashier way, make it look nicer. Yeah, it's uh, it's more fun. Anything, I mean, I'd I'd separate that from self defense training. I mean, proper self defense training is different to martial arts or combat sports because in a self defense situation, you really only need a right cross and a knee to the stomach. It's just the posture you do that from. It's your situational awareness, um, fighting from your everyday stance. Because if you're in um the physical confrontation in the street or whatever, if you're lining up. To get your coffee and you're in, in a confrontation, it doesn't start from a fighting stance. We put your left foot forward, right foot back, hands are up. It's usually from a speaking stance, and you're learning to fight from that position, which is completely different to anything you learn in combat sports training or in um, traditional martial arts training. I, I find it hilarious, like in, in a lot of like instances, and especially you know, you mentioned bars and pubs. I've got a background doing security in pubs and clubs as well and like so many people that are just so keen to get into a physical altercation with someone but they have no background in combat sports or they don't know how to even throw a punch properly but they're so eager to put themselves in a situation like that where it's like that like it, to me it just like it blows my mind of someone being that eager to get involved with not knowing how to fight or not being trained how to fight properly, but they're just willing to go and fight some stranger who they know nothing about, who have the, yeah. <laughs> they have no idea about their background. You know, and I, I think that also comes whether it be from, you know, fueled by alcohol or, you know, going to a, watching a boxing or an MMA fight and walking out there and have that testosterone built up. Oh, I just want to fuck yeah. someone up. Yeah. In reality, man, it's like, if you get into a real fight with someone and that person's got a better cardio than you, you're fucked. Yeah, you know what I mean? like you yeah. got one punch to make it count. <laughs> and I felt that when I got into, um, first got into Taekwondo when I was 16 or so, because before that I was a little rat bag piece of shit, getting into scuffles in the street, all that kind of thing. Then it wasn't until I started training 
that I realized that I don't know anything about fighting and how easily it would be for someone to fuck me up. And that sort of stops you from wanting to go out and get into fights with people. Because you realize how easy it is to hurt someone or how easy it is to get hurt, you know? Mm. You also don't need to when you've got that uh, outlet at the gym. Yeah. But uh, as well, like the most people that I know that are trained fighters, they're not going to get into a fight on the street with someone. <laughs> like they go look at someone, they're going to go, yeah. All right. Yeah. I mean, like they'll do, they'll go if they have to defend themselves, but they're not going to go out there and like, yeah, if someone's going to call them a fuckwit, they're going to go, all right, let's throw down. They're going to be like, nah, man. Yeah. Like, yeah. Well, because you don't have anything to prove then, right? If you're untrained and someone calls you a fuckwit, you've got something to prove. But if, hmm. um, you know, you're trained, it's like, I don't give a fuck what this idiot thinks. You know, if it's in the gym, I get it all out in the gym. Yeah, I don't need to prove that I can fight out here because the people who actually matter, you know, the other competitors, the guys who I'm actually sparring with in the gym, that's my mm. competition, not some junky shit cunt out here in Footscray. Well, dude, I, I, I had a boxing coach of mine and uh, I went out for a beer with him one night and, you know, he's a reputable boxing trainer here in Sydney and some idiot wanted to, to fight him. He goes, oh, come on, mate, we'll go outside and have a fight. And he goes, you got 10 grand? The guy goes, what? And he goes, that's how much it costs to fight for me to fight. You got 10 grand, put it on the table. I'll go, I'll go fucking fight you anywhere. And the guy's like, no, I'm not going to pay you 10 grand. He goes, I ain't going to fucking fight you. Fuck off. And I'm just like, but that was his, it like, but he was just saying it with a smile on his face the whole time. He was like, mate, fuck, pay me 10 grand. We'll fight. If not, you, no way. I'm a pro. I don't want to go waste my time on you, fuck with. Yeah, like, prize fighter. Exactly, man. Exactly. Yeah. But um, you know, as far as you know, once lockdown gets out, what are your your plans post lockdown um, as for wrestling? Well, same thing I was doing before. Just wrestle as often as possible. Keep training. Keep improving. Like I said, you get better every single time you wrestle. This is just about getting those reps in. Yeah. I mean, you know, do you would you like to sort of have an opportunity to go and try your hand in other states and, and overseas as well? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I was looking um, forward to going back to Japan or um, Korea, but, uh, you know, everything like that's on hold, obviously. Yeah. But until then, if it's just within the confines of um, Australia, I'd like to travel to every state, wrestle anywhere, anyone who wants to book me. Like I said, any match is good. Is there anyone in particular in the country that you haven't had a chance to wrestle that you want to get in there and mix it up with? Um, I mean, a lot of guys have already wrestled that I'd like to work again. There's more we can do. Um, and I guess uh, Damien Slater would be really good to work. Really love his training videos are really good. Yeah, we see his actual wrestling, his mat wrestling, self the fucking charts, and he's a legit grappler too. Um, I was supposed to wrestle Rat Daddy. I mean, that was booked and didn't happen. I'd like to wrestle him. I'd really like to um, wrestle Istria. We mm -hmm. sort of got to tie up a little bit at um, Deathmatch Down Under, but it was just the tease for me. I, I'd really like to have a full match with him. I think we'd do something really cool. Yeah. And what about intergender wrestling? Is that that's something that seems to be really big at the moment? Um, is that something that you're interested in doing, like rest, going up against the women and testing you know, your, your style up against some of them? Uh, yeah, I mean it's cool. I don't have a, I don't have an issue with that or anything. Um, I just don't like that too many intergender matches are exactly the same, mm. and it just makes it predictable. Uh, if I wrestle uh, a woman, I want it to be um, legit. I don't be I don't want to be pulling punches. I have them pull punches or just give them ten different variations of a head scissors as their offense. Yeah. Uh, I know Charlie Evans really good. I really like her work. Um, she'd be good to wrestle because she's a really good mat wrestler as well as a hard hitter too. Um, I wrestled Chanel Phoenix at a death match down under show. That was a lot of fun. That was the heavyweight tournament, right? No, the this was, um, I don't know what this was. This was before the heavyweight title tournament though. But she was fun to work. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, like I said, you know, if, if it can be, if it can tell a good story, Good wrestling is good wrestling. It doesn't matter if it's yeah, a deathmatch match or intergender. Good wrestling is good wrestling, man. And, you know, there's a lot of great talents out there that can definitely do it. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I really but, like Jessica Troy. Oh, Watch man. Her, her submissions yeah, are really crazy, slick. right? Yeah. Yeah. I love it. The first time I saw her wrestle was um, at an old girl show out here. I think it was for MCW. I was just blown away. 
that she was able to do actual wrestling and the crowd was behind it every step of the way. She didn't lose them, which is the problem, I think, with some people. They don't like to do wrestling because they think the crowd won't get into it, which is true. But the way she worked it, like, everyone was on the edge of their fucking seat the whole time. And she was just working an arm or a finger lock or something like that. Yeah. I, I mean, like, her chain wrestling style is is amazing to sit there and watch and to be able to sit there and go through and and like i said to see someone to be able to mix that together and still keep the audience captivated which you know yeah, obviously in, in this sort of generation of of people is like the attention span is very very short <laughs> so to be able to tell yeah. that it's it's it really goes to show the quality of performer yeah yeah big time but uh, look, it is that time of the show where we are going to have 60 seconds with Pierce. We have warned Snuff Daddy Gore, the big Gore man himself, how this is going to work. So basically what we're going to do is I'm going to fire a bunch of questions. You've got 60 seconds to answer as many questions as you can answer. There is no wrong answer to this because it's all personal preference and what it comes down <laughs> to. But uh, we're going to get going. You let me know when you started and I'll start the clock. Ready to go? You want me to let you know when I'm ready? Uh, yeah, let me know. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Go. Born ready, mate. Favorite song to sing at karaoke? Um, Tampon Tea Bag by Anal Blast. <laughs> Name a gross meal combo that no one else likes but you love. A what meal? What? A gross meal combo that no one else likes but you love it. Um, Tuna and peanut butter. Okay. Would you rather appear on Home and Away or Neighbours? Um, is Harold Bishop still around? That guy was fucking cool, man. I think he's dead. Neighbours. To honour him. Harold Bishop! <laughs> Early Bird or Night Owl? Uh, what? Are you an night Early owl. Bird or a Night Owl? Uh, Early Bird by circumstance. <laughs> night Owl by uh, choice. Plain Fairy Bread or Fairy Bread with Nutella? I don't need that shit, man. Fucking both. Which, which politician would you sit down and share a beer with? Uh, Hulk Hogan? No. Um, <laughs> politician. No, I don't know. Regan. Roller Regan. What was your nickname growing up? Uh, psycho. Aliens, real or fake? Illegal aliens. No, aliens, real or fake? Uh, I saw AC. That was pretty cool. Real. What game show would you be great at? Um, game shows. <laughs> I don't fucking know any game shows. Sale of the Century. Classic. Five, five star hotel or camping? Um, camping. You could do heaps of weird shit in the woods. No one can hear it. Snapchat as long as you're alone. Snapchat or TikTok. I don't use either. They're both fucked. It's TikTok <laughs> dancing kids and shit. I'm not into that. In five minutes, you are being shipped to outer space. What two personal belongings do you take with you, excluding human beings? My karambit and my inis. Time. That is it. That has been 60 seconds with Pierce. Uh, Gore, that was some interesting answers that you've given me, man. I much <laughs> appreciate it. But uh, where can everyone find you on social media? Where can everyone buy your merch and support you? Um, Snuff Daddy Gore on Instagram. If you want shirts, you can message me and I'll send them direct. Uh, if you want dick pics, that's going to cost you extra. <laughs> there you go, guys. Uh, Gore, thank you so much for being on Shooting the Shit. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure uh, and absolute uh, lot of laughs as well, man. I really appreciate your time. Uh, guys, make sure you check all of our exclusive shows out on the Realm Network, the Vince Russo-owned Realm Network, by becoming a subscriber, checking it out. You get Shooting the Shit Uncensored, you get Killing the Business, Get Funked, and Knights of the Gimmick Table. Huge shout-out to our sponsors, Sleefs, that one-stop shop for all your athletic wear, and healthvape.com, the place for all your healthy vaping alternatives. Gore, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on, man. Thank you so much for, for giving Thanks, up your time. Thanks, mate. Thanks for having me. Tuesday night. It's an absolute pleasure, man. We got it. You know what? We should do it. We should do it part two with you and Cracker Jack together, man. I reckon that's yeah. <laughs> Snuff Brothers United, mate. 
<laughs> I feel I feel like I would lose control of that show very quickly. <laughs> oh, very quickly, yeah. No doubt yeah. about it. <laughs> but, mate, thank you so much. Uh, guys, we'll catch you next week. Make sure you uh, check out all the shows, and we'll catch you very soon. Take it easy. Peace. <laughs>